Welcome to the lecture series on neuronal dynamics. In this video, we look at the Fokker Planck equation in the presence of a threshold. So here is an example of a membrane potential trajectory which goes up. At some point, it hits the threshold. There is firing, there is reset, and then the whole process starts again. Now, previously we said that the Fokker Planck equation will have a Gaussian distribution. So we could say there is a mean and then I have a Gaussian distribution around the mean. However, in the presence of a threshold theta, this is just not possible because there can be no membrane potentials above the threshold. In fact, Whenever a membrane potential is close to a threshold, the spontaneous spike arrivals will kick it across the threshold. So the result is that the density of the membrane potential at u equal theta is zero. So it cannot be like this, but the membrane potential must be like this. Now, there's another effect because once a neuron has fired, its membrane potential is re-injected at zero. And this will lead to a kink of the distribution at zero, as we will see um, in the following. So let's look at this Fokker-Planck equation. The Fokker-Planck equation describes the change of the membrane potential density and it has a term that's a, a, a drift or velocity term proportional to the density and then it has this sigma squared the variance that's proportional to the second derivative now spikes that are sent they are sent at threshold and then the membrane potential reappears at the reset potential and uh, this gives this little kink that I mentioned. Now, how many spikes per unit of time will be, will be emitted? Well, that's exactly this quantity A of t. And each membrane potential that hits the threshold is deleted there and re-inserted at u reset. And therefore, this is also the factor that appears in front of this delta function. Now we have calculated this drift, gamma of u. We've also calculated diffusion term. Now let's continue to work on this in view of this condition that the density at threshold is zero. So the question we would like to ask now, what is actually this quantity A of t? What is the population activity? Now the population firing rate or population activity A of t corresponds to the flux at threshold. So let describe what this means. The population activity therefore is j at u equal theta. We have seen that J, the flux, has two components. It has the drift component, and then it has the jump component. We can insert what we have learned about the drift component. It is minus u over tau plus r times the external current. This together is the velocity of the membrane potential or the slope of the membrane potential. And then in the drift term, there comes also a contribution from the jump component. And that gives a term, a first term arising from the jump component, which is new defining rate, spike arrival rate, 
times delta u jump. And then the whole thing goes proportional to the density at threshold. And then the jump term yields a second contribution, and that is one half new ddu p of u t at u equal theta times delta u jump squared. On the previous slide, I explained that the density at threshold must be zero. So this term here, p of theta, is zero at all times t. The threshold acts as an absorbing boundary. Whatever main product potential arrives at threshold disappears from that location. So this means that this whole term here does not contribute. The only thing that contributes is this term here. And the result is that this A of T is proportional to DDU P of UT, the slope at U equal theta. So we can think of the flux through the threshold as proportional to the slope at threshold. And the flux at threshold is important because this really is the population firing rate A of t. With this in mind, let us look at a couple of applications of this formalism. We'll start with uncoupled networks. We look at an uncoupled network of leaky integrant fire neurons where each neuron receives stationary stochastic input. And then we make the assumption that this also leads to stationary asynchronous firing so that the population activity is constant. And therefore, the individual neuron firing rate, firing rate of single neurons is also the same as the population activity. And this is going to be an analytical result. And that's how we start. Thereafter, we will also look at time-dependent input, and we will then go from uncoupled networks to coupled networks. But let's start with this uncoupled network in the stationary state. So here again the idea, we have leaky integrant fire neurons. They are driven by excitatory and inhibitory current pulses, so that we have control over the variance without changing the mean. Effectively, in terms of differential equation, gives gives a mean drive, which we can balance if the spike arrival rate of EPSP and IPSC are the same. And then this gives this noise term. And now for these stationary situations, so the input current generated by stochastic spike arrival has a constant mean and a white noise term, we can calculate the mean firing rate as a function of this noise strength sigma. And basically with noise, the function will smooth out. But we can do more. We can also look at the distribution of membrane potentials. And this is shown here in a simulation. This is over 100 milliseconds the membrane potential, and the condition is that excitatory and inhibitory spikes arrive with the same rate. It's a finite rate. So if you look closely, you can still see the individual jumps. Now, if we average over a large population, we get this distribution, and it has the little kink here that I described. And this was for the case sigma, the standard deviation, sigma 0.2, which also corresponds to the simulation. And the correspondence is just perfect. 
if we have enough neurons, if the individual contributions of the spikes are relatively small, it's going to be a nice, Gauss, a nice distribution. And the density at threshold is indeed zero because as soon as a membrane potential hits the trajectory, it's gone and it reappears below. It reappears at the reset potential, which was zero here. Now, if we change this standard deviation, if we make it smaller, we get a higher peak, which is sort of closer to the threshold. The threshold is at one here. If we have a sigma equal 0.5, we would get the curve here. Now, for these different sigma values, we can now calculate the mean activity. And this you can think of this as a population activity equal flux through th threshold. Or you can think of this as the single neuron firing rate for constant input with this noise component averaged over a very long time. And again, for sigma equal 0.2, this would be the fine rate as a function of membrane potential, I call this the input potential, the mean drive, the contribution to the membrane potential caused by the input, um, the actual membrane potential fluctuate because of stochastic spike arrival and because of the reset, but this is the input trim part, the input potential. Potential caused by the input. Now we have seen that if there were no noise, then the function would more look like this for the leaking integrated fire neuron. Now if I have a lot of noise, it's really smeared out a lot. Message here for stationary inputs leading to a stationary state, we can calculate the membrane potential distribution and we can calculate the fine rate equal to the population activity, which is stationary. So that was the uncoupled network. We found results. We can calculate the single neuron rate equal to the population activity, and this population activity is given by the flux at threshold, and we assume that we are in a stationary state. Now let's stay with the uncoupled network, but consider a time-dependent input. Then the population activity itself will also be time-dependent. In that case, a direct analytical solution is no longer possible, but we can use the Fokker-Planck equation for a numerical integration. And this is what we are going to do next. So here's the situation now, again, as a function of time over 100 milliseconds, there's some time dependent input, the population activity changes as a function of time. And for each time step, I can also look for a given time step, I can look at the distribution of membrane potential. And you see that this distribution of membrane potential also changes. And the point is that simulation and theory agree very slowly, very closely, as shown in this little uh, sample here. Again, as a function of time, the solid line is the theory and the dashed line is the dashed histogram or the gray histogram is the histogram gener excuse me, generated by numerical integration of the differential equations of the Fokker-Planck equation and also the membrane potential at this moment in time at 20 millisecond that is marked here um, looks very similar between the gray bars from the, numer from the simulation and uh, the solid line from the numerical integration. In summary, we know that in absence of a threshold, the Fokker-Planck equation can always be solved. But in the presence of a threshold, we need to take special care. We think of the threshold as an absorbing boundary and the density at threshold must be zero. And for fixed spike arrival rate, we can look at a stationary state and uh, we can predict analytically the stationary distribution of membrane potentials and compare it with simulations. The stationary distribution is not Gaussian. Not Gaussian, well, it has to be zero at the threshold and its peak is roughly one sigma below the threshold. 
Now for time-dependent input, we can numerically solve the Fokker-Planck equation. That's a numerical solution. And we can also compare with the simulation of a large but finite number of neurons. And again, the agreement is excellent. In summary, the Fokker-Planck equation provides a tool for understanding neuronal dynamics.